Hey there, you're listening to the Girls Talking Life podcast, and I'm your host, Johanna. If you're like me, you love time with friends. I always leave feeling encouraged, inspired to try something different, or I've learned something new. So why not continue to grow even when we can't be with our girlfriends? We're not made to do life on our own, so in each episode of this show, I'll bring you a girl and her story to give you refreshing ideas to stir your soul. Let's walk this road together. Are you ready to talk life? Welcome back to the show. I am so honored that you chose to spend some time here. On the last episode, we started a series on women's wellness. I talked with Julie Watson about physical health, and we focused on food and movement. Today, my guest is Nicole Zasowski, and we dig into emotional and relational health. Nicole is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's a writer and a speaker, and she's based in the state of Connecticut, where she lives with her husband and son. We start our conversation talking about identity. She tells us from experience that when everything you've built for yourself is stripped away, God shows you where your real identity lies. Nicole talks about her struggle with infertility and the pain and loss that she's experienced because of it, but how God's truth in her life never changes. Nicole and I also walk through the definitions of emotional and relational health, and she explains how they're so closely tied together. She also gives us some guidance on how to examine and then take steps to improve our emotional and relational health. I think you're really going to love my conversation with Nicole. Hi there, Nicole. Thanks so much for being on Girls Talking Life. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here. I would like you to start by just telling us where you live and who your people are and then what a normal day might look like for you. Yeah, so I currently live um, in Connecticut um, in a town that would really be considered a New York City suburb. So the culture is very influenced by New York City, even though it's this quaint New England town on the coast of Long Island Sound. And so it's, it's kind of a, a mix of different lifestyles. What a lovely place to live. Yes, yes. You kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the quiet of the small town, and then you have access to the big city when you want to, which is great. But I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so this is a very new thing for me. I I mean, I shouldn't say new. It's almost eight years in, um, (laughs) but I still am getting used to being an East Coaster. So uh, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I feel like that's more in my blood. And who are the people in your life? Oh, so many good people. I have uh, my family. So um, I am married to a wonderful man named Jimmy. And we have our son, James, who's going to turn three at the end of February, um, which I can't even believe. So they're the the special people in my life. And then we have a fantastic community here, which God has really blessed us with, has been the biggest gift of Connecticut. And then I've still got my West Coast people that love me well from afar, and I love them. So That sounds great. Yeah. What does a normal day look like for you? So every day is a little bit different. I am a marriage and family therapist. Um, I used to do that almost all day, every day before my son was born. And now I, I condense that schedule. Um, so... Um, it's important to me. I feel called to do it. So I want to continue that, that part of me, that therapist part of me. Um, and so I do that about two days a week. And then um, the rest of the time I am home playing with my son and knee deep in Legos and puzzle pieces and snowballs. We got those for Christmas, fake snowballs. So we have snow, indoor snowball fights. Wonderful. Yeah. My girls are a little bit older. They are eight and 11. So oh, fun. We still have some Legos around here, but it's not, uh-huh. really, not quite so much playtime anymore. Those are fun ages though. Yeah. So tell me just a little bit about your personal journey, how you moved from the Pacific Northwest over to the East Coast and, and what your life has been like. Yeah. So that's a, that's an interesting story. So I um, went to school in California. I did my college years and graduate school years there. And that's where I met and married my husband after growing up in Seattle. So that move, the big move across the country was, was from our community in California. And um, I didn't know, I always say my husband wanted to move and I needed to move because I had no idea what God would reveal to me in that journey. Um, I was incredibly comfortable in California. 
I had everything I had dreamed of and, and thought that my life was sort of a, a result of the, my efforts and what I had worked for. And then it was all taken away. I had to leave it at the state line. Um, I didn't have my connections anymore. I didn't have any kind of reputation. No one knew me from Adam. I was walking into the unknown with an identity that was totally built on my achievements and how people knew me and my reputation. And when I couldn't bring that with me, I had to figure out who I was without it. And that was really painful because that was just the beginning of a, of a journey that was a season um, that's been painful in a lot of ways. But what God has done with that pain is pried my fingers off idols and entitlements that I thought m- made me me. And he's shown me who I really am with all of that stripped away. His valued daughter that's valuable outside of performance and when we know Jesus, we can have a peace and joy that's outside of circumstance, which I really hadn't known before. I thought you find joy on the far side of a dream realized or a goal achieved, that then you get to experience the peace and joy. But what he's taught me is that, no, I can have that now. And so that's been such a gift, even in the midst of a lot of pain. My husband and I, we didn't move across the country, but we moved from one part of Ohio to another part of Ohio. And I don't think it was as big of a shock for me as what you're describing, but I can definitely relate to that. Mm-hmm. We won a family when we mm-hmm. moved here and I had just gotten a hand-me-down minivan from, <laughs> <laughs> from my in-laws uh-huh. and um, it was just this brown minivan. And I remember thinking, this is what people are going to think of me. I'm driving my kids around in a brown minivan. Like they don't know me mm-hmm. and it's hard to lose your identity mm-hmm. or feel like you are when you move into new circumstances like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think it matters whether you move across the country or to the next town. I think um, there's always opportunity to remind ourselves that home is a person, not a place. And for me, it was definitely that opportunity. How would you say that you moved through that season? So I, that was just the beginning of, Um, some painful events. My husband and I struggled with infertility, still do, um, because it's it's not a solvable issue for us. Um, So I have had five miscarriages to date, and each one of those has done the same thing, honestly, that the move has. I mean, it was excruciatingly painful. It's not something that I would choose off of a menu for myself, but I've moved through that change and loss by understanding and having a clearer understanding of what doesn't change. And the the one thing that's never changed is God's truth in my life and his presence. Have I been disappointed and heart-wrenchingly confused as to how my good, why my good can't match the goodness that God has? Absolutely. And I still do. Like, this is not a tie up with a bow. Everything is happy all the time. But I have found a lot of joy in Christ's presence in it with me and knowing that that's a joy that can't be taken away and reminding me that we are not, this is not our home, that we are called to. Um, invest in this place and to bless the people around us and to love our neighbors. And, but this is not ultimately the home that we were made for. And it's taken me a while to not see those lessons as consolation prizes. Actually, this is very recent. So you're getting this kind of real time, but I kind of saw those lessons as like broccoli on the plate, like something that was good for me, but not necessarily something that I would ever enjoy or find joy in. And recently I've just seen those things in the wake of what I lost as like precious lessons. Like these are, my mentor recently told me, you know, hope only gets deployed in times of struggle. And I am definitely not (laughs) thankful for the, for the struggle. Um, But I can be thankful in the struggle because I'm a person who knows hope. And I'm really grateful I'm a person who knows hope. That isn't easy when God calls us to be a poster 
person for something that <laughs> we no. never wanted. No, no. And yet I want to be a good steward of that pain. You mentioned several miscarriages, but you do have a son, James. Yes. Yeah, my miracle boy. How, how did that go? So um, actually looking back on it, it's even more. Uh, so we had two miscarriages before him, and we've had three since. So honestly, the three since make me appreciate the miracle of him all the more because I actually don't know how – how he came to be. I mean, it's very, very rare. Um, And lots of things have to go right for that to happen. We have had some medical intervention that's, that's been helpful that we've done, but um, that hasn't always worked either. So, and I'm a big believer that it's always God moving the pieces anyway. Um, And he's the one moving through any intervention or lack of intervention we have. So it, He's God's gift to me. That's the only explanation I have. I had miscarriages before both of my girls. And the first one was super scary. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we were able to have a child after that. So, I mean, what a miracle that is. And also, you know, just knowing that it's possible for your, Mm -hmm. for your body. And yeah. um, So the second one was also not, (laughs) not a fun event to experience, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, having your, your miracle baby there with you mm-hmm. is so special. Yes. Yes. Makes me really grateful. I got to have him. Well, I invited you here to talk about uh, relational and then also emotional health. Mm-hmm. And I want to start with emotional health. My interpretation of this is your relationship with yourself mm-hmm. and then the inner workings Yep. You know, and then relational being your relationship with other people, kind of the outward um, display of that. So am I right on that topic? And then how is, how is emotional health different from mental health? Oh, that's such a good question. So yeah, you, you described that beautifully in my mind. Um, in fact, that's often how I describe it to my clients um, because we don't think about the fact that we have a relationship with ourselves. Um, because we are so used to the, uh, our own voice in our heads that we don't realize that we, the things that we say to ourselves, either out loud or in our minds, probably most dangerously, um, have a tremendous impact on our sense of identity and our sense of safety. So the messages that we give ourselves on a regular basis have huge power, um, not only for how we feel about who we are and whether or not we're safe in the world, um, but they also have implications for how we interact with other people. So I practice a motto called restoration therapy, and they say that we say that there's four main buckets of ways that people tend to react to their pain. And there's very specific things in each of these buckets, but the broad categories are blame, um, shame, which is that blame turned inward, um, control, and escape. And that's where it gets tangled in the health of our relationships with other people because we all have ways that if I understood your story would make total sense. We all have ways of protecting that pain Um, that's understandable, but not very helpful to our relationship with ourselves or other people. And the problem is our culture tends to look at those four and we, we see, you know, raging anger is really unhealthy, but we might not see control is really unhealthy because our, our culture and especially a lot of workplaces really celebrate controllers. And this time of year, it's so interesting to be talking to you about this, you know, shortly after the new year, because, this is like January is a controller's haven, <laughs> you know, the, the goal setting and, um, and not that that's a bad thing. And, and if you love goal setting, that doesn't mean that you're controlling out of your pain, but it's just fertile ground for us to deal with our pain. If I just am perfect, or if I just can do everything or if everything goes exactly the way I plan, then I can be okay. And so that's where it gets tangled with our relationships with other people. I am learning about the Enneagram right now. Oh, yeah. 
And I think I haven't, it's not crystal clear to me yet, but I think I'm a one, which is okay. a <laughs> Yep. Yep. I can relate to parts of one as well. Yeah. I, I love my goal setting and mm-hmm. um, that also puts me in the anger triad. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. All those things that you just said sound very familiar yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think too, when we don't have a healthy relationship with ourselves, we often go looking to other people to regulate that pain. So that that's where the relationship with ourselves has such strong implications for our relationship with other people, because we start making other people responsible for us feeling good about ourselves or, uh, we're only as good as our last performance. Like everything we, we inform our identity based on our external interactions or achievements. So what are some ways that we can kind of examine our emotional health? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my, my first encouragement is always just to think about your story and think about the messages that you might be carrying around on a regular basis that you don't even realize that you've picked up along the way that are, that are true about who you are. So when, when we feel pain, we feel probably the same three to four feelings 90% of the time. So we're not having hundreds of feelings all the time, but, but you and I could go through the exact same circumstance and I might feel inadequate and worthless and you might feel alone and powerless just based on where our previous wounds are. So I'm not a believer that we can fully blame or credit our backgrounds for the people that we are, but I do think that our stories have a profound impact on the way that we experience our current relationships in reality. So I would say just to play with your story a little bit and, and be willing to examine what are the messages I'm carrying around about who I am? Is it that I'm only as good as my last performance or um, that nothing will ever be okay if this doesn't happen or, you know, and, and these are subtle. So they, they kind of take time to examine and extract um, because we've gotten so used to them that they, they start to sound normal. So I would say that's a, a big first step. And then what are the ways that I've tried to protect myself that aren't working anymore. And for me, one of the biggest ones that was revealed in that move was performance. Like that failed me when I moved to the East coast, I thought, Oh, I'll just do that again. And it didn't work. And that was really painful when it didn't work, but it was a huge gift to me because I realized, Oh, it was never meant to work. That, that was a cheap version of health and healing that I was settling for. Would you say that most people, this is a really broad statement, but would most people benefit from seeing a counselor even for just a short amount of time to maybe work through what those feelings are? Yes. Um, that was a quick yes. And I'm biased, obviously. <laughs> right. um, but in fact, I just went back to my counselor for a few sessions um, just because some stuff was coming up for me that I needed to work through. And as a counselor, I'm certainly not a believer that you need to be in counseling for the rest of your life. But I I think it's a great resource to give you a structure to examine that story and to meet with someone who's trained to ask questions that you might not think to ask yourself or are too afraid to ask yourself. It's wonderful. I hope this is the service we're providing, but it's a wonderful experience to sit with an unbiased, comforting presence as you examine your story with a guide that can ask you questions again, to provide a structure that will help set that story free and help you understand these are the events that happened, but what were the messages that you took from those events? What did you learn in, in that relationship? What did that relationship teach you about who you are and whether or not you were safe in the world? So it's been a huge benefit to me personally, and certainly what I, what I hope to provide my clients. Thank you. I, I've been considering it. I don't feel like I have any trauma that would, you know, suggest that I needed to see a therapist, but I just feel like if you can be a better version of yourself, if you can dig into some of that stuff and heal anything that isn't as it should be. Right. 
that that's a great step. Yeah. And we all, none of us um, walk through this life unscathed. And that's one of the stigmas that I love speaking into is that counseling is certainly not for, you know, just those who our culture would say, quote unquote, need it. As you so rightly said, that it's a lot of my clients just see an area of their life that is causing them some trouble and and want to figure out how they can not just move around it, but move through it in a really healthy way and come out um, that better version of themselves or, or come out a more healthy version of, of who they were made to be. You have a post where you talk about a Japanese virtue. You call it the craftsman spirit. Shokunin Kishitsu is my guess. I, I think that sounds good. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> This, I feel like this goes along with what we're talking about mm-hmm. a little bit. The Japanese have coined this phrase to describe a work ethic and a sense of pride one should take in everything one does. So how might this value change the way we approach the year in 2019? So to me, what that means is our culture tends to give us a lot of messages about what it means to be successful. And we have a very narrow view of what that looks like. But you and I are called to different things and balance in our lives looks different. For me, balance is more about congruence that am I living in a way that reflects the values that I hold. And so whatever that looks like for you in the new year, to take pride in living in a way that reflects your values and giving what you can to this thing that you're hoping to focus on or, or, but, but not measuring it against either a cultural standard or what you see going on in somebody else's life or um, any of that. All right, I really like that concept. Yeah, me too. Me too. It brings a focus and a narrowing to stay in your own lane and give what you can to something. And I feel like we need a constant reminder about that. Yes. Yes, I certainly do. I know that to be true, but... <laughs> mm-hmm, exactly. Can we live, live that truth? Right. Okay. Let's talk about relationships now. What are some characteristics of healthy relationships and then the inverse? Big question. So I would say a healthy relationship is best made up of two healthy individuals. So two people who are owning their stuff and on a journey to work on that stuff, whatever that is and whatever that looks like in an interdependence, but not making the other person responsible for healing that pain. So interdependence is different than dependence. Interdependence is more, I'm sharing the most vulnerable parts of my life with you and I'm trusting you with that, but I'm not, I'm not letting go of those vulnerable things and just letting whoever, Um, hold those vulnerable parts of myself and do whatever they want with them or expecting people to heal what someone else broke wounds that I'm carrying. So it's, it's vulnerability, but it's not neediness. And there's a fine line between those two, especially in our, our culture. We think that vulnerability sometimes um, we think that vulnerability is, just sharing the raw parts of myself and hoping that someone else will pick up the pieces. And that's actually my biggest concern with things like social media, that it's great to share vulnerably, but if we're, what are we sharing for? Are we sharing from a place of value, knowing that no matter what kind of responses we get, whether we get any responses at all, number of likes, whatever it might be. Are we sharing from a place of value that we're going to be okay no matter what happens with that post and that we're just sharing it to show what God has done in our story or the way that he's moving or what we're learning and how we're growing? Or are we sharing it for something? And that can be where it gets really scary. So I would say those are just a few examples of um, hallmarks of healthy and unhealthy relationships where a healthy relationship with yourself is really the best foundation you can have for a healthy relationship with others. And that looks all sorts of ways, depending on the relationship. You work with the hideaway experience Mm -hmm. and um, I'd love to hear more about this. Yes. 
I feel like I have a good marriage, uh huh. but there's always room for improvement. So what, yep. does, what does the hideaway experience provide? Yes. So the whole range. It's uh, actually, for what we were talking about earlier, it's a fantastic way to understand your own story in a structured environment and how it's impacted the way you feel and the way that you have coped with your pain. Again, that's totally understandable, but not so helpful. And then, you know, your, your spouse is doing the same thing. And so then you get to see what does this look like when we're both in pain? So you, you start out looking at yourself. Yes. Individually together, but talking individually. So there's no, there's no individual portion of the experience, but you're focused on your own story and listening to your spouse's story and others because it's a, a group experience. Um, and then you get to see what that looks like as a couple when you're in pain. And the cool part is you also get to see what that looks like when you're at peace. So getting to the truth about those feelings and then what does that set you free to do differently? If I really believe that while I feel those things and the feelings are real, this is what is true about me and this is what's true about my own empowerment, then what, what does that set me free to do differently in life? What does that set me free to do differently in my relationship? And then all of a sudden that describes a couple at peace and that's a really cool, intimate, connected experience. So that's one of the things we do at the hideaway is identify what we call that pain cycle and then identify that peace cycle. That's good information for everybody to know, regardless of whether um, you have a good marriage and you want to, you know, take it to a great level or um, just tweak a few areas or just um, check in on, on some things that, maybe you haven't checked in on in a while. And it's also a great resource for those couples that are in crisis. And what, one of the fantastic things about it is most therapy is kind of a one hour per week type structure. And then the whole week goes by before you have your next hour. This is a concentrated four days and we call it an intensive for a reason, but <laughs> Um, cause it's, it's intense, but it's beautifully intense and it's, I mean, it's the bang for your buck and you go away. And I think there's something to be said about that. Absolutely. The hospitality at these places are, cause there's three locations are top notch. The facilities are top notch. They really want, and that's one of their values. They call it sequestering is you don't get any opportunity to do that or very rarely do you get an opportunity to get away like you can at one of these experiences. Every meal is taken care of. Everything is done for you. The hospitality is above and beyond. One of our hosts say, um, they always say to the couples when we first arrive that uh, the only thing we can't get you is things you don't tell us about. Wow. And that's, and, and you can see tears in people's eyes when they say that just serving them a meal that the love that you feel when you're there is a really fertile ground to do some really great work that's really for everybody. My husband and I will be celebrating our 15 year anniversary oh this summer. Oh my goodness, congratulations. Thank that's you. A big deal. <laughs> and we've been talking about a trip we want to take somewhere. Uh-huh. I wonder what you would think about doing this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean it's a it's a great experience. Um, But definitely celebrate that some way, somehow. We absolutely will. So tell me what your role is with this intensive. Um, So I am a therapist. We work in teams. So most often male, female teams. And I am there for the four days. I fly down because the location I most often work with is in Rome, um, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. And I fly down and I work with my partner who is most often um, Tim and he and I do co-therapy for the five couples for four days and we eat together. So we really get to have a sense. We get to know the couples inside the group therapy and then just have some, you know, do life together, break bread together during the meals as well. Tell me a little bit about group therapy. 
I know it's, sounds- it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like the scariest part. And I tell them this when they get there. It's it sounds like the scariest part, but it's actually people's favorite part by the end because what you learn about your own story when you hear other people processing their story is huge. Um, and it just facilitates your own ability to think about your journey. And it's crazy the combinations that, that get put together. Um, and I, I see it as a total God thing every time that he just brings these couples together for such a time as this. And one couple, we don't do advice giving across um, couples in the group, but just the strength you can draw from other couples who are going through similar situations. And sometimes the circumstances are extremely similar and sometimes they look different, but at the core, the strength you can draw from the group is, is a really special thing. I love listening to other people's stories, but sharing yeah. mine, sharing my own is a different, uh huh, you know, it's different a thing. vulnerable thing. But that can be powerful too. And of course, you know, there's there's strict confidentiality around the whole thing, and so sure. we put some safety things in place to make sure it's safe. You mentioned some other locations, Georgia, and then where else could people find this? Yeah, so um, Georgia, there is one in. Um, Outside of Amarillo, Texas, it's on a beautiful canyon. Um, every one of them is, is so gorgeous in different ways. And then the other one is just outside of San Diego. Okay. But I believe the website is intensives.com. I think there's a couple different ways you can find it, but that would be one way. Okay. And we'll link to that in the show notes. Yeah, perfect. You have an article called how to work a room when you'd rather walk out of it. Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I really loved when you talked about owning your value. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that I've been very, you know, you walk into a room and you think, well, what are people thinking of me? What are they going to think of what I say? It's very intrinsic. Yeah. And you're talking about pretty much the opposite. Mm -hmm. Can you just go into that a little bit? Sure. So I think the anxiety for me too of walking into a room is the unknown of how are people thinking about me, like you said, and it's different for all of us depending on where our insecurities are, but um, how am I going to be able to win people over as an example or just you, you feel like you're fighting for that value, like you're starting from zero you're starting from empty and you're looking to get filled and every conversation is an opportunity in this mentality to either fill you up or deplete you. And that's a really scary way (laughs) to think about social interactions. And that's why they can be so anxiety provoking is that if you're only as good as your last conversation or the last person made you feel, then it is a scary thing to quote unquote work a room. Um, but if you walk in and sometimes I'll even give myself a pep talk of truth before I walk into a room that I'm nervous to walk into, like I am not what I do. I'm not my last performance and I'm not who people think I am. I'm, I'm me. And so that gives me confidence to just be myself and know that there's value in that and that other people are really special and important and I enjoy my conversations with them, but I am not going to give them the power to define my value. That's, that's more power than any other person should hold um, when we're talking to other people. And as followers of Christ, I think that we want to switch it around and say, you know, how can I be a blessing to the person that I'm going to talk to? Exactly. Someone once told me there's, there's two ways to walk into a room. You can either say, look at me like in your own mentality or, oh, there you are. Yes. And I think a person who is filled up already and isn't looking to fill their cup can have that overflow of, oh, there you are and make somebody else feel really special that you were excited to see them or ask questions about their story or it's just a totally different, and people see it. Um, you can tell the difference between somebody who's sort of drawing into themselves because of their insecurities or somebody who's overflowing to bless other people. I agree. I like that. Well, could you give us any, I know we talked about emotional health 
um, tips for identifying and, and being healthier that way. How about relationally? Mm. I think investing in your relationships, I think they are the most precious gifts God has given us. I think they're the only eternal thing of this life. And often they get put on the back burner, not that they're not important, but it's easy to put projects before people. Um, And this is something actually my mom is so good at, and I'm so grateful I learned from her. She has a phrase called people before projects, and she's not, um, I don't know why I'm tearing up right now. (laughs) She has a big birthday on Friday. Uh So one of the things that I appreciate about her is that she has taught me so well to put people before projects, and she's not the woman that's going to be getting the most things done in a day. She's not the woman who is going to be leading nine different, you know, groups or, or campaigns, although she is a great leader, but she is the person who's going to give you her time. And she is the person who's going to make you feel like you're the only one in the room. And she's not going to look for the most significant person to talk to. She's going to talk. She's going to be present with who she's with. and. I, I think that perspective in a world that tends to value time and people based on achievement and what we can get done and having something to show for our time, I think being present and opening um, space for people to share their stories and to make them feel significant is one of the best gifts we can give each other in this culture. And I I wish I was as good at that as my mom, <laughs> but, but I, I'm hopeful that maybe someday I'll get there. Maybe by the time I'm, I have my 60th birthday, I'll get there. <laughs> That's something I'm working on. Mm-hmm. I have my list and I like to get my stuff done and it's hard for me to take time for people. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who was on a missionary trip in Azerbaijan Mm-hmm. And she said that the women there, they kept uh, some special things in their house at all times. Okay. If anyone came to visit, this is what they would offer. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but, uh-huh. you know, tea and you know, uh-huh. they got everything out and they stopped everything they were doing and they sat down and they may have a guest for hours. Right. And it was just so important. That's part of their culture to, yeah. you know, sit face to face and talk as long as, as long as the visitor wants to stay and, yeah. you know, to have things to offer them and to bless them while they're in yeah. their home. And yeah, what a different paradigm. Um, and I think that brings up such an important, as you're talking, I'm thinking about just the willingness to be interrupted. That is hard for me. Like if I wake up in the morning and I have a certain vision for how the day is going to go, it can feel like an interruption, but it's such a beautiful interruption. And I wish I saw it that way more. I think I could, I think I'm missing out by not having that more of that in my life. So we can both work on that together in 2019. That sounds good. good. I'll I'll add it to my list. There you go. (laughs) Allow the interruptions. Yeah. Okay. Nicole, you have co-authored a book called Families and Forgiveness, and this is a tool for therapists. Am I right about that? Yes. It's the primary audience is for therapists or pastors or people who are in a helping profession that are dealing with that topic a lot. But the, my caveat to that is always, if it's a topic that you are interested in and want to go deeper with, it's also a great resource. It's just a very, um, it's a deep read. So go slow. <laughs> <laughs> and then you are working on a book. I am. Yeah. I am. It's to release next year. Tell me about that. Yeah, so it should be, I don't have a, an actual date yet, but it should be almost exactly a year from now coming out. And it's a lot of what we were talking about in the beginning of our conversation. Um, it's my story, but how um, in the midst of losing what I thought I wanted, I found a deeper truth that I needed. And um, just all those precious lessons and that hope and that peace and joy that cannot be taken away and what I found in the wake of, of some deep loss and disappointment. Well, Nicole, my last 
segment is um, to ask you for your favorite oh, five. Yes. What are you reading, wearing, drinking, yeah. watching? What's what's in your life so right now? So many things. So um, it is it is the new year. So <laughs> this list might look different um, in the by the time we get to July. Um, but I have. I've done it for years. I have this green drink I drink every morning. It's actually a powder that I just put water in. And most people, I don't know how good it is. It's good to me because I'm used to it. But as I'm recommending it, know that it may not (laughs) be the most tasty thing in the world, but it's called Greens First. And I just feel like it's all my fruits and vegetables that I need for the day and packed with. And it's just a powder that Uh you add water to. Okay, that's a lot easier than my green yeah, smoothie. See, I oh love goodness. the idea of smoothies, but I'm like in the morning with the spinach and the coconut water and the whatever else they need, and, and <laughs> I'm missing this ingredient, and um, the blender's going. Yeah, so I I just yeah. need easy, and so this is easy. It's called Greens First, and you can just get it on Amazon. Okay, I and love then that. my work bag. Um, I've had it for so long and I was just reflecting on how good it's been. Have you heard of, um, the company able, it used to be called fashion able. So it's that leather that looks better with time, um, which is all their products are so beautiful. And I take this bag everywhere. It kind of works as a purse, but it holds like my laptop and as a writer, I like to go to coffee shops and sometimes I'll go into New York city and it's nice to have a bag that is like the perfect size. It fits my laptop that I don't feel like I have this huge thing I'm lugging around, but it's bigger than a purse. And have you had it for a while? So does it look, I've had it for a while (laughs) and I like it even more now than I did. I'm looking at it right now. Um, than I did when I got it. So, and they come in all sorts of beautiful colors and I love the mission of that organization that they really, to empower women. So that's, it's fun to shop from a place, you know, is, is doing good in the world. Yes. I helped myself to a birthday bag Did you from really? there last year. Okay. Yes. It's not, it's not big uh-huh. enough for work stuff. It's just, well, a, but yeah, I, I visited them in Nashville and I was really impressed with their storefront and wanted everything. So I had to get out of there quickly. And when people see it and like it, you can say, Hey, I exactly. got it from this company and it was you know, made in Ethiopia by right. these women. It's a who, fun story yeah, too. So I love um, that too. This one is surprising to me. Um, but the first thing that came to my mind was puzzles when you asked this question, because my husband and I just did a really challenging puzzle between Christmas and New Year's. And we both take that week off, but we were home this year for, for the holidays. And it was such a great way for me to discipline myself to rest, which you would hope one wouldn't have to do, but I definitely do as someone who's I'm right there with haunted you. by her to-do list. And um, I think that rest, I often look at it as like a reward for getting everything done rather than working from my rest. And I really discipline myself to do it. I could tell I was approaching burnout before Christmas. And I just thought if I don't take time off, you know, I really need this. So the puzzle was just such a great way. It was amazing what different conversations opened up when we were working on it together. And it was a fun shared project. And I still felt like it was an activity. I wasn't just sitting around, but it was fun. So I'm kind of a puzzle person now, I guess. (laughs) I really like that. And everything you just said completely resonates oh, with me. Oh, I'm glad I'm not alone. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I need to get it done exactly. before I can rest. And the rest is a, a reward. And that's not no, the right way to think. No. Yeah. The, the fourth thing is a daily audio Bible app. I, I didn't know how I would like listening to the Bible, but I spent a lot of time in the car and it's, it's like a typical one-year Bible reading plan, like some from the Old Testament, some from the New Testament, and then a Proverbs or two and, and a Psalm. And I have left it. I love listening to it, just puts it in a different place in my brain that I hear it differently than when I'm just kind of scanning it on my own, particularly those passages that you wouldn't go to 
like in a Bible study or that you don't often like those obscure books you don't often hear about in a sermon. I'm just learning a lot and seeing the Bible as a complete work and its message in totality is a powerful thing. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to listen to that regularly. What's the name of the app? That you it's use? just called Daily Audio Bible, but I think there's a okay. few. So in the in the podcast icon, it's red. <laughs> it's the red one. Okay. Um, All right, I'm gonna yeah, it's things. it's good. And then I I really enjoying hiking right now. With I have a very active three year old, well, almost three year old, and this time of year in the winter time, um, it can be easy to in the Northeast go inside all the time. I'm sure where you live too. Um, it's just yeah. cold, but I love what getting outside. I, I love what it does for me and my son and the conversations we have and getting to watch him experience God's world and what getting outside does for me mentally and emotionally is really important. So it's a time of year where I, I have to discipline myself to get out. But once I'm out, I'm so grateful. Um, and we have some really pretty hikes around here too. I bet you do. Yeah. That sounds good. Well, Nicole, thank you so much. I really just enjoyed our conversation here. I loved, you know, the vulnerability that you were willing to share with us uh, about your story and then your expertise on some of these topics. Um, I know I'm going to further explore kind of my own emotional health and then kind of take a temperature on some relationships and to see what you can take from mm. good to better. Well, you know? I appreciate you having me and I love talking about these things. So <laughs> I'm grateful <laughs> for the opportunity and I enjoyed our conversation as well. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Friends, I hope you loved my conversation with Nicole as much as I did. Connect with her on her website, www.nicolesasowski.com and at Nicole Zasowski on Instagram. Be sure to look for more details regarding her book releasing early next year. Connect with me on Instagram at Girls Talking Life and find everything we talked about on the show, including Nicole's favorite five on girlstalkinglife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter. You'll get free downloadable conversation cards and you'll have each podcast episode automatically delivered to your inbox. Don't let the conversation stop when the show is over. Share your stories and start conversations with the girls in your life. Thanks for tuning in. 